It's now my honor to introduce Calvin Budd Trillin, well known for his droll humor and laugh out loud storytelling. In 1965, I met Budd in London, where he and his, had, he had traveled with his girlfriend, Alice, to get married over there. My then girlfriend, now my wife of 58 years, was boarding the same plane in New York on her way to see me in London for our fourth date. She had known Bud before and before me, of course, because she had dated his Yale roommate. This chance meeting all those years ago has surely been forgotten by him, uh, but not by us. <laughs> During his 60 years of prolific writing, Bud Trillin has authored 30 nonfiction books. His signature focus has been on his late wife, Alice, Alice, his family, food and pleasures of eating, and his, and most, perhaps most important, he's focused on race. He has written also three novels, five books of light poetry, which contain his wicked brand of political satire, and hundreds of essays in The New Yorker, where he has been a staff writer since 1963, but has also been a columnist for Time Magazine and for The Nation. Once called the Buster Keaton of performance humor, <laughs> he appeared in two one-man shows, and his loving memoir about Alice was staged as a play. His collection of comic creations entitled Quite Enough of Calvin Trillin won the James Thurber Prize for American Humor. As a food writer, Bud's prose is delicious, in part because he's always hungry. He is attracted to restaurants, street vendors, and truck stops alike. His love of Southern food was colorfully expressed in his New Yorker coverage of a hot tamale festival in Greenville, Mississippi, which happens to be my hometown. One of my favorite quips about what he ate during his childhood is this one. The most remarkable thing about my mother is that for 30 years, she served my, served my family only leftovers. <laughs> the original meal has never been found. <laughs> Bud's penetrating reporting on race in America is filled with insights into our country's long history of racial discrimination. Indeed, his first book, An Education in Georgia, is a landmark story of two courageous black students, Charlene Hunter and Hamilton Holmes, who in 1960 desegregated the University of Georgia. His collection of dispatches entitled Jackson, 1964, is drawn from his 50 years on the New Yorker race beat. All of these stories are relevant today. Bud's latest release, The Lead, which you can purchase and have signed following the presentation, is a fascinating portrait of journalism and the illustrious people who have practiced it. Joining Bud in conversation is Philadelphia's own Bill Maramow. As a reporter for the Philadelphia Inquirer, Maramau twice won a Pulitzer Prize for public service and for investigative reporting. He was editor-in-chief of the Inquirer from 2006 to 2017. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Calvin, Bud, Trillin, and Bill Maramau. Well, looks like a full house here tonight. Bud, are you ready for action? I think so. I am. <laughs> They don't look dangerous. <laughs> I, I wanted to start out and tell you um, how I first encountered um, the name Calvin Trillin. And this occurred back in 1971 when he was writing the US Journal. And he wrote about a childhood friend um, named Fats Goldberg. Was that his last name? Yes. And um, mm. also known as Three Case Goldberg. Uh, in the course of that, he mentioned some of his um, the restaurants in Kansas City that he'd enjoyed both as a uh, child and a young man. And then in um, August 1972, I went to a wedding in Kansas City 
of my high school friend Tom Horn and a woman named Kathy Calkins who'd grown up on Belinda Drive, which Bud knows well. Mm -hmm. And um, on the, at the rehearsal dinner, we had um, ribs from Arthur Bryant's Rib House. And then in the next afternoon, we went to Winstead's for hamburgers. And those were two of Bud's favorite places. And you can read all about them in the course of uh, some of his work. Um, there are very few writers who can make me laugh out loud. And there are very few who can make me cry. Um, Bud is someone who's capable of doing both. He can make me laugh out loud, and he can make me cry. And um, when, you, when you read Bud's book, The Lead, um, I want to read a passage from it, which is one of his favorite leads. And um, I, won't read, I won't belabor it, but I guarantee you that if you read the book and you read his dissection of this lead, you, like me, will laugh out loud. And here it is, it's from a chapter known as The Lead. And he's talking about the fact that you might say that I'm a collector of leads. I assume that's my, why my friend, James Edmonds, who lives in New Iberia, Louisiana, sent me an article that appeared in the Advocate of Baton Rouge on September 23rd, 2019. If the function of a lead is to engage the reader, this article's lead seemed to me remarkably effective. Here it is. Quote, a veterinarian prescribed antibiotics Monday for a camel that lives behind an Iber Iberville Parish truck stop after a Florida woman told law officers she bit the 600 pound animal's <laughs> genitalia <laughs> after it sat on her when she and her husband entered its enclosure to retrieve their deaf dog. <laughs> <laughs> and you're going to have to read Bud's book <laughs> to, under, to, to, to appreciate and laugh at his dissection of that lead. So one of the things I loved about the book is that Bud um, goes into a whole uh, array of remarkable characters, um, most of them journalists, many of them people you've not heard of or you may be aware of just uh, peripherally. Um, today I was having lunch with my old friend Michael Bamberger and I started talking about Edna Buchanan. Edna was a police reporter for the Miami Herald who won a Pulitzer Prize back in 1986. And about a week or two before she won the Pulitzer Prize, um, a profile appeared in the New Yorker about Edna Buchanan by Bud. And um, Michael, who hadn't thought of the name in 30 years, was able to quote from that profile. <laughs> so Bud, would you talk a little bit about Edna Buchanan and um, mm. how you went about doing those stories, which were just remarkably um, precise and detailed and colorful? Well, she was a great character, or is a great character, I should say. Um, uh, she specialized in murder and <laughs> She, uh, and, and Miami was a good place to be if you specialize in murder at that point. Um, and somebody asked me the other day, what, what was her special quality? And I said, I think relentlessness. Um, if, you were, if you were talking to Edna Buchanan and, and uh, she was asking you questions, the conversation went on a lot longer than you expected. Um, and if somebody got murdered and um, Edna found that it was better to get out of uh, the, the neighborhood and back to the office because she said uh, we're in the actual place of, of the crime, uh, there was too much yellow tape put there by the, by the police and she couldn't get at people. So she went back to the office and she telephoned the next of kin, whoever it was. Uh, and if that person understandably thought this was an insensitive and outrageous <laughs> thing to do uh, and hung up on her, she counted to 60 <laughs> and then she called again. <laughs> and she said, 
I said, you, you, what was that minute? For, and, and she said, well, somebody else might answer the phone who's a more talkative person. <laughs> somebody might have said, you should have talked to that reporter. It was terrible that, that so-and-so was murdered. Uh, and, and that very person might have changed uh, his mind about talking to Edna Buchanan. Uh, and then I said, was that it? And said, she didn't call a third time. That would be harassment, she said. <laughs> uh, so um, she was interested, and, and um, I, I talk a lot about her leads because they were uh, often made up of, uh, of a paragraph that ended with a short sentence, like a, a paragraph of, you're going to shoot me, so, 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 and finally said, he did. Uh, <laughs> in the Miami Herald, that was known as a Miller chop. Uh, and that's because Gene Miller, who was a marvelous reporter, um, I think he won two Pulitzers for getting people out of uh, death row. Um, he liked using a, a, a lot of reasonably sized sentence uh, and then ending with a, a, a couple of words. Um, somebody on the Herald said, he writes as if he's paid by the period. So I enjoyed being with Edna. Uh, she, oddly enough, was a person who had a lot of cats and talk, baby talked to them and didn't seem like a crime reporter at all. Another, um, another person whom I enjoyed reading about was the late um, Johnny Apple of the right. New York Times. And um, I commend that profile to you from Bud's book. One of the things that I really liked about that profile was as I was reading along, I encountered someone who will be familiar to any Inquirer alum in this uh, audience, and that was uh, Doug Robinson, right. the former city editor of the Inquirer. And Johnny Apple, as Bud will tell you, uh, was a prodigious talent. He was also an egotist and an unremitting braggart. Hmm. And um, as a prodigious talent, his colleagues admired him. But as a uh, fabulist in some ways, hmm. um, they criticized him. So at one point, he was in the Albany Bureau with our city editor, our later city editor, Doug Robinson. And um, the entire bureau would go to the bar and they'd just dump on Johnny Apple. You know, conceding that he was a talent, but deciding that he was, in effect, an asshole. <laughs> At one point, Robinson decreed, listen, we've got to stop this. We know he's a great reporter. Anytime someone criticizes Johnny Apple, we're going to throw a quarter into the pot, and that'll be used to buy drinks. And so for several weeks, according to Bud, mm -hmm. they, the, the colleagues honored the moratorium. And then one day, Doug Robinson, who called the executive editor of the New York Times a psychotic maniac, <laughs> walked into the bar, threw down $10, and said, Apple's such an asshole. <laughs> <laughs> and Bud, I'm wondering, after reading the profile, number one, what did you think of Johnny Apple? What did he think of your story? Well, uh, I, knew, I knew Johnny for a long time. We were uh, college editors at the same time. And, uh, and met in, in college. Um, the opening of that profile uh, is an example. I had an editor at The New Yorker named Bob Bingham who always said, uh, Trillin and McPhee start their stories in the middle. Um, <laughs> and and uh, I, I, it took me a while to figure that out. But the opening of the Johnny Apple profile is, is an example of that. It, it begins, um, the consensus in the trade, I'm happy to report, is that R.W. Apple Jr., Johnny Apple of the New York Times, is easier to take than he used to be. <laughs> uh, uh, it, it, was, it was sort of, uh, st I think what he meant by starting in the middle is it was, it's as if you jump onto carousels that's going around, 
So, so with the first sentence, you you know that Johnny Apple um, f was found irritating by some people. Um, he, he actually became became less egotistical as he aged, and um, I thought I had, had a theory once that he was saved by gluttony. Um, <laughs> the, this fantastic energy that he had uh, uh, was channeled finally into just eating as much as he could find. Um, and and um, the reporters did admire him because he, because he was, he, he uh, and they admired him not only for his writing, they admired him for his expense account. Uh, <laughs> the, the Times had uh, an accounting system then, I think they were called cost centers, so each department got its limit of what they could spend. And so there was a cost center for foreign news and a cost center for sports, a cost center for Johnny Apple. Uh, <laughs> and um, he, he uh, at one point I said, you know, I, I think, Johnny, even though you've never won a Pulitzer, you might get one if you donated your expense accounts to the Pulitzer. Uh, <laughs> I, I think they would find those worthy of uh, library treatment. And he said, but I can't do it because the Times has them. I don't have them. And he actually took it seriously. He was a... <laughs> uh, so he was, uh, I, he was the rare reporter who is, when he's described in Apple stories, which were a sort of a subgenre of reporter stories, uh, if he entered a restaurant, the verb was he swept in. Um, <laughs> and um, so I, uh, I find him a, found him a, a wonderful subject for, for a profile because not only because he was so colorful himself, but also uh, the people around him, the reporters uh, who had come across him, like Doug Robinson, um, were, were good at telling stories. Um, and uh, I, I, Tom Brokaw you used to refer to one of Johnny's um, dissertations uh, as uh, when he was in the full apple. Uh, <laughs> uh, so, yeah, if, if, uh, I, I'm not sure if he was the last of the swashbuckling reporters, but, but he was one. And the other thing I should say about him is that he, he specialized in, uh, I think reporters are generally generalists. Um, um, and but but they they get to specialize in one thing or another. He wasn't an investigative reporter. He was very good at what I think Times called the cue heads, the analytical things. And he was very good at uh, what is sometimes called in journalism uh, parachuting in, uh, going to a place where he hasn't been, although there, there were increasingly were few places he hasn't been. Um, and uh, he and he, he did cover Vietnam. Uh, actually, the first paragraph of the profile uh, relates an old story that Johnny, in those days, uh, rather brash, um, was boasting about being in Vietnam, and that he actually had uh, killed uh, two or three people, um, and. Uh, a, a veteran reporter was standing nearby, and he said, women and children, I presume. Uh, 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 so even the, the remarks we made about him were interesting to me. Uh, but um, what did Johnny Apple think of the story? Did you ever get oh, some that, feedback? That, that's a, a good question. Uh, I, I, at, at that period, the New Yorker promotion department used to have a list of people they delivered the New Yorker to on Sunday, I think, when it came out. I think. 
And he, he obviously w made sure he knew one of those if he wasn't one himself. And um, um, he, he called me. Oh, no, I'm sorry. He hadn't seen the story yet. He called me and he said, uh, Dick Holbrook called me. Dick Holbrook definitely was one of those people. Uh, and said it was a pretty tough story. Uh, and I, I said, let's wait till Johnny reads it. Uh, and I think he was okay with it, because he said uh, there, there was an earlier uh, book of, called Boys on the Bus, uh, which was by Tim Krause. And, and uh, uh, he, he said, in one, on one hand, it made me out to be a, a great reporter. On the other hand, it made me, made me out to be uh, an asshole. Uh, and I think that's what he thought of the profile. But I, I saw him after that. I guess we had a kind of a longitudinal relationship because it lasted from 1957 or something like that. Well, I commend that highly to your attention when you read the book. Um, I asked Bud because I always believe that people of his um, versatility and excellence have mentors. And I asked him about that when we talked on the phone a week ago. And he said, well, I can't really say that I had mentors, but he mentioned three people uh, whose work he greatly admired. One was Joseph Mitchell, who some of you have probably heard of, a uh, New Yorker writer, um, from the 30s and 40s who in the 50s started to, his productivity started to decline and suffered from depression. Claude Sitton, who was probably the dean of the civil rights reporters for the New York Times mm -hmm. during the epicenter of civil rights movement in the 60s, and Russell Baker. And I, I'd, I'd like you, Bud, to tell us a little bit about Claude Sitton. And the reason I ask that is because um, many of us worked with Gene Roberts at the Inquirer. Oh, and Claude Sitton uh, hired Gene to succeed him on the civil rights beat at the New York right. Times. Uh, well, uh, Claude and I were in Atlanta uh, during uh, a, a year, but I guess the fall of 60 to the fall of 61, which happened to be um, good fortune for us, not, not good fortune for people who got hit on the head or anything. Um, uh, a year of, of uh, great activity in the civil rights struggle. There were years when, when not much happened uh, because Washington wasn't really pushing the issue at all. And um, uh, Claude lasted for a long time as a Southern, uh, in, in the Southern Bureau of, of, of the Times. And you kind of felt in, in those days that you were like like a uh, an American uh, news bureau in a foreign country, um, and uh, there was some some tension in in how to how to cover the civil rights struggle. Uh, there really wasn't any moral equivalency between uh, people who thought that all Americans should have the right to vote and. Uh, other people who thought that that those sort of people ought to have their houses burned down. Uh, I mean, it wasn't like covering the Ohio State-Michigan game. Um, and Claude, though, I think managed to uh, to expose a lot of things without uh, w w any obvious bias. They would have called it on on one side or another, and. He called me once on a, a, a Sunday night, and he said, there, there's, there's a race thing in, Monroe, I think it's called Monroe, North Carolina. They're, shoot, they're shooting people. And he said, let's go. And I said, OK. So we got on a plane, and we got over Charlotte, or wherever the nearest airport was. And the pilot came on and said, uh, it's too foggy to land. We're going on to our next destination, Indianapolis, Indiana. <laughs> it could have been Toledo, but I think it was Indianapolis. And Claude said, it's not even in the South. <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> but he was uh, he was a, a fine reporter, and uh, after I was back in New York, uh, he had a story in the Times about a voter education meeting in a in a black church in Georgia, where the sheriff, somebody named with a sheriff's name like Zeke or something like that, uh, came in. And I read the story, and, and it was the, I thought, I was really scared when I read the story. And then I realized I'd probably been scared the whole time and just too dumb to admit it. Um, <laughs> so he, he, was, he was a masterful reporter. Um, could you tell us a little bit about um, your relationship with Joseph Mitchell and the, the kind of decline of his productivity at a certain point in his career? He wrote a, a book called, uh, he wrote a story called Up at the Old Hotel and a collection of his work, which for those of us who are too uh, young to know him in his heyday, really is a great collection, which I recommend to you. Uh, well, I thought he was, he was a great writer. Uh, he... Uh the thing I particularly admired about his writing is he, he got the marks of writing off of the story, and so it just looked like it came out. And, and um, he, uh, he was from North Carolina, and uh, like a lot of out-of-towners, made a particular specialty of, of, uh, of New York. And uh, he... Also, there's something sort of mystical about him. He, when he first met my wife, uh, he said to her, you've got the eyes of a Mecklenburg County Scot. <laughs> her father had come from the next county. Um, and sometime later I said, how did you know that? Uh, he said, uh, well, how would you know to, to, to talk to, about being a Mecklenburg County sky? And he said, well, there were two or three counties there. One of them was more rural. When I Mecklenburg County, I said, well, how did you, I mean, how he chose those two counties in the world, I don't know. Um, but but I, I greatly admired him and to the point where my wife would occasionally say, because he came to the New Yorker every day when, 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 he, when he wasn't turning anything in. She said, why don't you ask him to have lunch? Or who I couldn't do that. <laughs> <laughs> like asking a rock star. So I, I wasn't up to that. I don't, I don't like to... Actually, I don't like to call strangers on the telephone, <laughs> which is really odd for a reporter. Uh, <laughs> it's somewhat of a handicap, I have to tell you. And um, tell us a little bit about your relationship with and your admiration for Russell Baker. Well, Russell, Russell Baker uh, was, was a truly great columnist and he had such control of the language that when you read the, because some of his pieces were just funny, and some of them were quite serious, but you you could you were sort of put in the mood in the first few sentences, um, and uh, he used to to say how he became a reporter, he uh, I mean how he became a columnist, he was he covered the Congress as a reporter. And he, he said he spent a lot of time sitting uh, outside of these uh, closed committee hearings, sitting on the marble floor of the, of the congressional building, uh, waiting for somebody to come out and lie to him. Um, <laughs> and and he, he would know that, that, that they're lying, and they would know that he knew they were lying. And he said, and he also he came from Baltimore, where people sat on those marble stoops. And uh, in Baltimore, they said if you sit on the mar marble too long, you get piles. Uh, <laughs> so he he decided he wasn't going to be a reporter anymore. He was going to be a columnist. <laughs> but I think, like a lot of things, uh, Russell said, it, it wasn't meant to be taken too seriously. He wrote a column about. 
about walking on the east side of New York, the Upper East Side, and uh, a potato fell out of, of, of a window high above him in one of those <laughs> high rises and nearly hit him. And um, uh, the column was about how you, you didn't want your demise to be at all uh, <laughs> risible. Um, uh, uh, and uh, there was a point where I was having trouble starting a column and, and, I, and I said, I'm thinking of going for a walk and maybe a potato will fall. Um, and my wife said, Russell's already done the potato column. <laughs> I mentioned at the outset that um, Bud can make you laugh, he can also make you wince, and he can make you cry. And um, I highly recommend About Alice, which is about Bud's late wife, a beautiful woman, a great writer in her own right. And um, I read a book called Messages from My Father. Oh, yeah. And um, in, in the book, Bud, you said that your dad told you, quote, you might as well be a mensch. That was his only advice to me. <laughs> and I'm wondering, number one, how would all of us interpret that? And how, how, how'd you do over these 88 years at being a mensch? Well, the, that would be somebody else's judgment, I think. I, I, uh, I, I always th thought my father's aspirations for me were pretty simple, uh, that I become... Uh, the President of the United States, <laughs> and his fallback position was that I not become a ward of the county. Um, uh, and he, um, a mensch, as most of you know, because it's practically in, in the American English language now, uh, is someone who is upright and does the right thing. and. Uh, not only sacrifices for a friend, but also leaves a borrowed apartment nicer than it was when you got there. Um, and um, the way, I, I like the way he put it, you might as well be a mensch. It's, it's <laughs> not as if he hadn't considered the possibilities not to be a mensch. Um, but he, he was, a, my father was a sort of a bright line guy. Uh, he, he, if something was illegal, it was illegal. I, I believe I am, uh, I was the only boy in, in the Midwest who never drove a car before it was legally uh, permitted. So it's, 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 it's the law. Uh, uh, and probably the only uh, small boy who, after he was 12, uh, paid full fare at the, uh, the, the, at the movie theater. Because... Uh, uh, my my father thought that's that's the way it is. You, it's the law, uh, and he had a kind of a playful side as well. He um, he wrote a couple. He had a he was a grocer for most of his life, and uh, then he after the war he sold the grocery stores right away. He hated the grocery business, and uh, at one point he had a, a restaurant. And uh, he had a couplet on the menu every day, uh, usually about pie. Uh, his shortest was, don't sigh, eat pie. Um, and, and he had things like, all right, warden, I'm ready to fry. I've had my last piece of Mrs. Trillin's black bottom pie. Uh, actually, actually, my favorite of his poems he wasn't much on meter. He was good on, on rhyme, but um, <laughs> it was, uh, eat your supper, mom said gently to her little son, Roddy. If you don't, I'll break every bone in your body. <laughs> um, um, <laughs> but uh, in, in, Amer in America, and, and, and I think in that book I discussed that even though my father talked very much like Harry Truman and um, uh, had, had a lot of Midwestern qualities, actually was born in Ukraine and uh, came as, a, as, a, as an infant. Um, 
and, and I and I think wanted me to be an American. I mean, um, and uh, in America, son is supposed to uh, outdo his father. I mean, that's the way it is. So I I think I did on on uh, short poetry. Uh, <laughs> um, uh, Don't say pie is fairly short, um, but I wrote a poem. Um, the I don't know if I remember the title, but the titles don't count. The title was something like the political and philosophical and societal implications of the O.J. Simpson trial. <laughs> and the poem was O.J. Oy vey. <laughs> but um, I have one last question before I turn it over to your fan club out there. Mm -hmm. And that is, um, you know, many of us are reporters and writers ourselves. Mm -hmm. And I'm, I'm wondering um, for you, mm -hmm. um, you, in one of your, um, I think it may be the prelude to uh, the lead, you say that um, other magazine writers would say, Bud, how can you do it? One story every three weeks. Yes. When, your, when your newspaper friends would say, what are you doing with the rest of your time? Yeah. So my question is, um, how difficult was it for you to do the reporting, mm. do the writing? When you got down to writing, did you spin it out, or did you write and rewrite and agonize over every word? Well, th this, this was done entirely in the typewriter age. And um, I, I actually had a sort of a, a system. Uh, I, when I got home from, from reporting the story, uh, the, the next day, uh, I would write a, a draft uh, that was maybe two thirds of the length of the piece, and and I didn't even look at my notes, and it also got very sloppy, and the the language sort of deteriorated. <laughs> Around the house, it was called the vomit out, and, <laughs> and I did it on yellow paper, and um, I would I, I then I wrote half of a, of a rough draft the next day and, and the next half the, the day after that. And um, I'm not sure I ever stopped in the middle of a sentence, but, but I was pretty, I, I didn't go over, I, I, I stuck to what I was, my goals. And, uh, and I, then I typed up, uh, the, some of you may remember, there were some things called carbon packs. <laughs> <laughs> the, um, the, and I turned it in. I went to the New Yorker to type it up, um, and and sometimes I didn't even look at the vomit out after I ever. I, I think what it was was taking an inventory of what I had in my head and what would work and what wouldn't work, um, and and uh, so the vomit outs I I just threw away, and. Uh, I was always afraid that the cleaning women at the New Yorker would discover one of my vomit outs, <laughs> and they would say, they would laugh and laugh and and, and smash their brooms against the <laughs> desk like hockey players, and uh, as he calls himself a writer. <laughs> uh, Bill said he was going to do this, and I didn't believe it. But <laughs> anyway, um, I, I guess. Obviously, in the time that you've been doing this, the media landscape has changed a little bit. And I'm just wondering if somebody trying to do something, having a career similar to yours, doing it with the skills that you have, would you be able to do it now? And, and if the answer is no or anything close to no, how do you feel about that? Well, I, 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 I do think you, you could have um, a career uh, in what, I don't, the phrase didn't exist when I was doing those things, but uh, long form journalism or something like that. Um, but not in sort of a general magazine, which, which the, the, they seem to be fading. So I think they're more niche magazines and then there's that guy who I, I can't remember who first brought him up, who 
is in, in his uh, shorts in the basement um, writing a blog or something like that. So uh, I, I, th I think it just takes different forms. Um, but I do wonder, as, as you read these constant stories about uh, how many people were laid off and which, which uh, newspaper is closing or, or how, how the, num the number of, of reporters that, that a big city newspaper has at City Hall uh, or whether there are enough to let one of them loose on a long piece at one time. Uh, it's, it's dispiriting, yes. And uh, I don't know whether I would have gone into uh, reporting. I, I'm not sure if I knew then. I think I sort of stumbled. I, I think a lot of people my age uh, sort of wandered into journalism because the novel didn't work out or, or the, uh, something like, or they got a lot of pressure from, uh, I actually had some pressure from my father um, who I, I thought um, when, when he sent my sister and, and me to Sarah Sean Hooley Secretarial School um, <laughs> um, because, because if, if my aspiration, if his aspirations for me were that I, they be president or not become the ward of the county, I, neither one of those people really need to know typing. And, <laughs> and uh, to, to, you send girls to typing school. Um, but but uh, he, he, I think he panicked at the end and wanted me to go to law school. And, and uh, he even sent my Uncle Jerry, the leading intellectual of Saline County, Kansas, uh, actually the city librarian of, of, of Salina, Kansas, uh, who was on, uh, at a conference in New York, sent, sent him up to New Haven to try to persuade me to go to law school. And um, I said, I don't think I want to go to law school. I see these pictures. There's a guy like, usually played by somebody like Clark Gable, who uh, at the end of the meeting snaps his briefcase shut and says, I'll have my lawyers draw up the papers. <laughs> I don't want to be that schlemiel back there <laughs> drawing up papers all the time. <laughs> so I don't want to go to law school. <laughs> Uncle Jerry said, I don't blame you. <laughs> you wrote a wonderful piece about the delicatessen in New York where you and your wife and girls used to go, and the owner said if you ever wrote about it, you would not be allowed back. <laughs> Do you remember that story? No, I, I think that, that would have been um, Kenny Shopson, who had not a delicatessen, but a, what, what started out as what is usually called in New York a corner store, and gradually turned it into a restaurant. And it had three or four booths. Yeah, he... And, he, and, uh, and yes. It, it, it didn't hold many people, but right. had, there were 900 items on the menu. Yes! Uh, <laughs> uh, Which brings me to my question. Do you remember what's in an Egyptian taco? It, 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 I, I, it, I think it was an Egyptian burrito. <laughs> um, um, it was neither Egyptian nor a burrito. Uh, and Kenny had very strict rules. Uh, one of them was um, no copying. So if, if someone, uh, if you heard someone at the next table say, God, uh, the only thing I have here is, is uh, an Egyptian burrito, and then the waitress comes and you say, I'd like an Egyptian burrito, no copying. <laughs> uh, uh, but it, it was, it was a, a, a wonderful place, and he was actually a, a, a marvelous cook, uh, self-taught. And um, uh, in addition to the 900 items, and the fact checker of the New Yorker really did count the 900 items, um, he, uh, uh, 
he would he would uh, assume that one of my daughters, Sarah, would order that something that wasn't on the menu, which was uh, Sarah's lo mein or something like that. I can't remember, but it was specific to a person. And uh, uh, I I think that uh, that Kenny Shopson's place and PS3 were sort of imprinted. Uh, themselves on my daughters, and and they, uh, as as people who lived in in Greenwich Village, and and uh, uh, so he was he was important. We they thought of it as a sort of an extension of our kitchen. Uh, I'm I, I'm bi coastal, and I I live in Philadelphia, but I also live in near Astoria, Oregon. And there's a great story that you wrote about Astoria and the Flavels, and I'm wondering how you found that story, and. Uh, you recall it, I'm sure. Uh, I, I do remember the story, but I, I don't remember how I found it. I, I was sort of desperate in looking for stories during that week, mm -hmm. to the point of going down to the newsstand that was then in Times Square, and buying 15 or 20 out-of-town papers, um, and looking through them. Uh, um, most most of what I read of what what I saw there was, of course, stories about Washington's argument about the national debt or something. Um, but occasionally, I'd find a story. The New Yorker didn't even have a wire service, and um, uh, once or twice, uh, uh, I, somebody somebody uh, sent me a clipping. And I saw something that interested me on the back of the clipping, uh, in the next page. So it was sort of. Uh, but the Flavel story was was um, interesting to me because I think partly um, it, it was an opportunity to talk about a place, uh, and and uh, that that always interested me. Um, I used to call it the old Manish Tano question. Um, uh, how is this town different from other towns? Uh, and, uh, and, and Astoria, I thought, was a particularly interesting place. Um, the first thing people told me when I got there, I think, uh, was something like, the Finns are not Scandinavians. <laughs> there are a lot of Finns there. Uh, not many Scandinavians, I think. Uh, when you were covering the Freedom Rides in the early days of the Civil Rights Movement, you wrote that, uh, I think it was you and Claude Sitton mm. were trying to decide whether you were participants or um, observers, because you were a journalist, whether you should get on the Freedom Ride bus, and um, how you made that decision, which was to get on the bus. Well, um, my my view of it was that it was a public bus, and and um, as I say, I was too dumb to be scared, and I uh, thought also other reporters are getting on. Uh, so we better get on. Uh, and Claude felt the same way. Um, and I, uh, at, at some point, uh, someone asked for a rest stop. And uh, the Mississippi National Guard person who had gotten on with a couple of soldiers at, at, the, at the state line said he was supposed to take the bus straight to Jackson. And uh, uh, one of Martin Luther King's uh, ministers, uh, I just lost the name, but uh, talked to the to the to the colonel or whatever he was, um, in a fan fantastic, eloquent way. Uh, I said the most eloquent request to leave the room I had ever heard, and <laughs> and and this reporter. Across the ways where we were sitting, started yelling at the 
at the Mississippi guy, and Claude said, shut up, you're a reporter. Uh, it seemed to me a reasonable compromise that we would ride the bus. Um, but it was Daddy King, Martin Luther King's father, was, was very good at passing the hat in these mass meetings, in, including to reporters. And he, reporters can't put money in Daddy King's basket. But then at, uh, there's a piece in the book about um, uh, going to the 50th anniversary of, of, uh, of the Freedom Rides. And um, uh, I was always accustomed to um, just quietly leaving when they started to sing, We Shall Overcome. Um, and uh, so I, I started to leave quietly from whatever meeting this was. And then I felt someone grab my arm. And I looked down, it was an elderly woman. And I thought, am, am I really going to wrest my arm away from this elderly woman? Uh, so I stayed. And uh, it turned out I, I knew most of the verses. Uh, <laughs> so I, I, I think the line between re being a reporter and being what the religious people call a witness uh, w was fading away. Bud, tell us a little bit about your book club. What are you reading? Who's participating? And um, how often do you get together? Well, supposedly about once a month. And, uh, and until, until uh, COVID, uh, we would meet at, at somebody's house. And... Um, uh, for dinner or, or, or drinks and, and dinner, and um, we only we only read fiction. Or I should only read fiction, and um, the only other rule was that you have to have takeout. <laughs> yeah. you, you can't. You're not allowed to cook. Um, and uh, we started out by with uh, five couples. And it was more than 20 years ago. Uh, and so we've, we've had some, some losses in the ranks. Um, uh, and and uh, we're now down, we replaced a couple of people. Uh, <laughs> and and um, uh, now down to about eight people. And we supposedly meet about once a month, but, but various sort of calendars get in the way. So it may be a little longer, and uh, I en I enjoyed it. I I, uh, I I messed up on the on on the timing. It got the wrong night or something. Did something like that at one point, and I said, um, "I'll take any punishment except reading the Magic Mountain again." So it varies a lot. So, uh, <laughs> well, we're going to call time out on the field. Um, Bud, this has been absolutely terrific. Thank you, Bud. And um, having read the lead, I recommend it highly to all of you. Get it. Be there. Be square. And um, Bud, you're going to get tired signing a book. Well, I hope so. so right. Thank yeah. you very much. Thank you. Thank you.